In my practice as a board certified dermatologist and acne expert, I often get asked about the role of lab monitoring with isotretinoin, also known as Accutane. In this video, I wanna talk about, do we need to check labs for isotretinoin? And if we do, which one should we check and how often should we do it? Before we start, I wanna just set up a framework to think about lab monitoring in general. When we're checking labs, we really should have one of two goals. It should be to try and prevent a severe side effect. Maybe we're checking liver tests to try to see if there's any risk of having a liver problem from the medicine, or we wanna guide dosing. We wanna see do we need a higher or lower dose of that medicine, and we use the lab monitor to help us do this. However, lab monitoring also has some potential harms. There's the cost of this lab monitoring, both to the health system, but also to us as individuals and patients. With high deductible health plans, we're increasingly bearing those costs ourselves, and so we need to be thoughtful about that expense of lab monitoring. In addition, lab monitoring is uncomfortable. You have to get a needle poke. People often don't like that. And for those who have kind of needle phobia or anxiety around needles, that can be an issue as well. And then finally, when we check labs, we're implying that something about that medicine is unsafe, that we need to monitor it. And that can sometimes create unnecessary fear around a medicine if that lab monitoring is unwarranted. So what does the data tell us about isotretinoin? When we look at a study of 1,800 patients being treated with isotretinoin, we look at their labs over that course of treatment, we can see that those who are treated with isotretinoin do have elevations in lipids and cholesterol and triglycerides. These might go off by about 20 or 30 points. Often this isn't going to be a clinically meaningful change, and this goes back to normal afterwards. So it's not like their cholesterol is going up forever and putting them at risk of increased heart disease. The main concern would be that it goes up a lot acutely and potentially causes some issues. And on average, that doesn't seem to happen. The other common lab testing that we do is looking at liver function tests. And when we look at those results in the study, there's really no statistically significant changes in average liver test values before treatment and during treatment. And similar, when we look at blood counts like your white blood cells and red blood cells and platelets, there's no differences in those before treatment and during treatment. However, as I was mentioning before, one of the reasons we check labs is to try to look for a serious and maybe rare side effect. So while average changes in these labs don't seem to be particularly clinically meaningful, what about some people are having really big changes in those labs? Is that happening? So if we look at lipids, for instance, we might be worried about having really high increases in triglycerides. And the reason that we care about this is that high triglycerides are known to be a risk factor for something called pancreatitis. Sometimes if you have very high triglycerides, that can cause an injury to the pancreas, which is an important organ in our body for doing a bunch of different kinds of things, and we wouldn't want that to happen. So potentially by monitoring triglycerides, we can identify those who have high levels of it and prevent them from getting pancreatitis would be the goal here. Well, first off, how many people have high triglycerides and isotretinoin? Well, in that study I was mentioning, really less than 0.7% of people have a meaningful increase in triglycerides, kind of getting to 500 or 1,000 in terms of that level of triglycerides, during the course of treatment with isotretinoin. And notably, many of these people, about three quarters of them, when we recheck it, it's just normal and they just continue their course on the exact same dose. And triglycerides can be a tricky thing to measure because if you eat a lot of fat in a meal right before you check it, that sometimes can influence that lab result. And so someone who's not getting fasting triglycerides, it might actually not be a medicine effect, but more just a recent diet effect. And when you check it again in a fasted state or they ate some differently before, it's more normal looking. So first off, very, very rare. And for most people, when we recheck it, it's normal and doesn't affect our management, doesn't change what we do. And again, the point of lab monitoring should identify risk of a severe side effect potentially or guide dosing. And neither of those things are happening here. Well, maybe it's not that useful. The other interesting piece of evidence is if we look at pancreatitis in the setting of isotretinoin, I mentioned the reason that we might wanna check triglycerides is to find those who are at risk of pancreatitis. This is a very rare occurrence. There are about 25 cases of pancreatitis reported in those taking isotretinoin, and there probably have been tens of millions of people who have been treated with this medication. So that is a very rare and questionably even associated with the drug side effect. And what's most notable about those who do have pancreatitis while taking isotretinoin is about 90% of them don't have elevated triglycerides. So if we're checking triglycerides to try to identify those who are at risk of pancreatitis, and those who do get pancreatitis don't tend to have elevated triglycerides, that's probably not that helpful. On top of the fact that elevations in triglycerides are quite rare and, ele and pancreatitis is even rarer. So the likelihood of us actually being able to meaningfully identify people who 
for at risk of this side effect by checking triglycerides, checking lipid panels is quite low. Well, what about liver function testing? If we do that same kind of thought experiment, we think about, well, of course, you know, people don't seem to be having a lot of changes in average values, but are there people who are having meaningful changes who might be sort of outliers? So if we look for those who have a grade three or higher abnormality in liver function tests, so that would be something that we might think is clinically meaningful. Again, it's very uncommon. About 1% of people will have a clinically meaningful grade three or higher liver function test abnormality in isotretinoin. But notably, it's just as common to have that lab abnormality before people start the non-treatment. So this may actually reflect just some background noise. If you check liver function tests in a lot of people, some are gonna have elevations for all sorts of reasons, maybe things that they're doing in their diet or lifestyle, maybe other liver problems. We know that acne is associated with obesity and obesity can be associated with a problem called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which can lead to elevations in liver function tests. So there's many reasons that people can have elevations of these tests. For instance, AST can be elevated with exercise. So there can be a lot of reasons other than the medicine. And the fact that people are having abnormalities as common before treatment as on treatment kind of suggests that a lot of these abnormalities are really background noise. The other notable thing here again is just like the story with pancreatitis, if we look at liver problems in isotretinoin, they're basically never reported. No one's ever died of a liver problem in the setting of isotretinoin. There really are almost no reports of true liver injury in the setting of isotretinoin. So even if there are some mild abnormalities in liver tests like AST or ALT, these might actually just reflect kind of liver adaptations that we can sometimes see with medications. We can see similar things with aspirin and heparin, and it may actually not be a true meaningful side effect that we need to worry about. And when we check these labs, we're getting ourselves alarmed by the numbers. We're sort of treating the lab instead of actually treating the person that we're taking care of with isotretinoin. And we might be reacting unnecessarily to data that's not helpful. So again, together, kind of these data on the frequency of abnormalities with them being similarly common at baseline on treatment, and just a general lack of any evidence that isotretinoin causes meaningful liver injury, call into question the value of this lab monitoring. And then, as I mentioned, when it comes to CBC abnormalities, we don't see any average changes. We also don't see those outliers. We don't really see significant, meaningful changes in blood count parameters like white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets either. And that again, like many studies in the literature, really calls into the question the value of this testing. Another way to think about this is the poll experts. So there is a Delphi consensus study conducted in 2022 where a number of experts in acne and uh, hepatology, kind of understanding the liver, came together and thought about a consensus. What's kind of the average lab testing protocol we should do for someone in isotretinoin? And the high level result of this was that the group recommended checking lipids, so particularly triglycerides and ALT, mostly because ALT is more specific than AST as the liver function test at baseline. And then again, two to three months after starting treatment, kind of at peak dose. And that goes along with what we see in that data from 1,800 patients I was sharing where you know, the abnormalities tend to stabilize. The lipid, they tend to stabilize after about two or three months when people kind of get to a stable target dose and are on that same dose. Things don't seem to change much. So checking them at baseline before people start to see if they have any pre-existing abnormalities. And then looking again, once people get to peak dose, which is usually around two or three months, and if those are normal, which based on the data I shared with you is gonna be true in about 99% of people, no further lab monitoring is needed. For those who have abnormalities, you know, we can discuss and share decision-making. Do we want to change anything about the drug dosing? Do we want to just follow and recheck these labs? Uh, so that would be kind of the, I would say the standard practice right now would be that Delphi consensus. But as I've been alluding to throughout this talk, I think it's very reasonable when understanding kind of the risks and benefits of lab monitoring to honestly consider doing no monitoring. Because again, the main labs we're checking are lipid panels, we're looking at triglycerides. And as I laid out, really, if we're looking at triglycerides to try and prevent pancreatitis, this both is a very, very rare outcome, if at all it happens, so the likelihood of us finding it is basically zero. And it's unclear that checking triglycerides is going to help us identify people at risk of it and prevent it, since 90% of the cases of pancreatitis and isotretinoin didn't have elevated triglycerides. Similarly, when we look at that liver function testing, really there's no evidence that people get meaningful lasting liver injuries on this drug. Now, one might argue that's because we're doing the testing and we're preventing it, but the flip side of it is that maybe it actually doesn't happen and we don't need this testing. And so again, I think there's a rational argument to just completely defer testing of lipids and liver function tests, and then 
complete blood cell count monitoring really has absolutely no value when it comes to monitoring isotretinoin. Now there are some other labs that people talk about. I think the most controversial one would be CPK, which is a test of kind of muscle breakdown. We know that rarely isotretinoin can cause a muscle issue called rhabdomyolysis. It's kind of a severe muscle injury problem that can sometimes be very dangerous. And so it might be nice if we had a test that could identify people at risk of that problem. However, CPK is not a very specific test and it doesn't seem like it's gonna be useful in this setting. If you just look at people who've exercised recently, they're gonna have elevations in CPK. If you just take a group of people and you check their CPK, about a fifth of them are gonna have some mild to moderate elevations in CPK potentially, depending on what type of population you're studying. So this is a test that's gonna have a tremendous number of abnormalities just because it's not a very good test. And while rhabdomyolysis is an important issue, it is extremely rare and often is accompanied by some symptoms like severe muscle soreness. So rather than checking CPK in everyone, where we're gonna find a huge number of false positives, everybody is going to be chasing the lab numbers and responding to those instead of what's actually happening to that individual. I think checking and select people who have symptoms makes more sense just from a practical standpoint until we have a better test that's able to identify those who are at risk of rhabdomyolysis or having rhabdomyolysis. So to summarize, isotretinoin can be associated with laboratory abnormalities, particularly elevations in triglycerides and cholesterol. In general, these are not clinically meaningful and monitoring them seems to be a very limited value. Similarly, there are potentially some abnormalities in AST and ALT, but it's unclear if they're a medication reflect and it doesn't seem like this medicine causes true liver injury as opposed to some potential mild changes in liver enzyme tests. There's really no evidence to suggest that complete blood cell count monitoring is helpful. And similarly, CPK, while we'd love to have a test for rhabdomyolysis, just doesn't seem to really meet the criteria of what we would want. And so I think a pragmatic strategy for an average person is to check triglycerides or lipid panels and an AST and ALT or just an ALT at baseline before starting the medication and then potentially again at peak dose and if these are normal to do no further testing and if there are some abnormalities to modify accordingly as part of shared decision making and think about dose adjustment and checking labs to monitor things over time. However, for those who really would like to avoid lab monitoring for whatever reason, whether it's cost, convenience, the discomfort or fear of needles, I think it is very reasonable after a discussion of the risks and benefits of lab monitoring to consider deferring lab monitoring in the absence of any symptoms and other risk factors for problems. And this is something as we get more data, we'll see if this becomes more of a standard practice over time. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Your support really means a lot to me and it helps us share this information with the community. Ask me your questions and share your experiences about isotretinoin lab monitoring in the comments below. And until next time, see ya.